This one over there. Um, okay, well, um, here I am, only Valley Radio and Rambling, then and now. Um, I just want to give you a very brief um, idea of how, how I got started in this. Um, it actually was um, during the bicentennial that my mother, Nyla Miller, had um, tried to organize projects to clean up cemeteries all over Brooks County, the private ones. Um, I think she had a lot of help here from various Boy Scout troops and 4-H Club and, and um, you know, Campfire Girls and things like that, and only in all over the county. Um, so that sort of got me interested. And then a few years later, um, a few of us had organized the Berks County Genealogical Society in 1980 uh, to sort of collect records of church records and tombstone inscriptions and things like that and make them available. Um, the Historical Society of Berks County has a huge library and lots of records, um, but we noticed that um, there were still a lot of little private cemeteries out of cornfields that hadn't been recorded. So that's when um, Mary Ellen and I um, started doing a little bit of research and the first thing we did, uh, we, well, we talked to George Miser, of course, and there was a man by the name of Raymond Kebab who had actually started to record a lot of these private cemeteries, so we had help from him. And the first thing we did was sort of catalog of all the cemeteries in Berks County. So we had one place with directions inside it of how to get there. And then, um, while I was doing that, um, I had a friend who just happened to hear about what we were doing, and she said, oh, my husband's grandfather did that in Oli. So she had all these little journals um, that she let me publish. So I have this little booklet here that um, were the notebooks of Chester Levandy Turk. And uh, we're very glad to have them because there's a few cemeteries that are gone, like the Curse Cemetery that he actually did record some inscriptions from. So that was very helpful. Um, and then, as Kelly said, it was about a 10 year project that Mary Ellen and I worked on. Um, just go around the county and try to talk to farmers. We had articles published in the Eagle. We got contacts. You know, people said, "Oh, I remember seeing tombstones 20 years ago." So we did a lot of research like that, trying to find these cemeteries and put them, put all the inscriptions in one place. Um, and then my friend Kathy also helped go around and just measure them all and count all the unmarked graves and things like that. So that was just a little bit of how I how I got involved in this. But um, what's really interesting to me are the, um, the history of the families, um, because they do genealogy too. Oh, oh and yes, I, the Berks County Association for Graveyard Preservation um, also was started in the early 90s by uh, Jackie Nine, and that's the Nine family cemetery that she had restored. And then um, she left a large um, amount of her estate to continue the work um, to preserve all Berks County cemeteries. So we're very grateful to their work over the years. So now what I'm going to do is just give you a little, I can't, you know, I, I can't show you pictures of every cemetery that we tombstone we found. And I was trying to make this a little interesting so it's not just one picture after another of cemeteries. So I'm trying to um, put together a little bit about the history of the people also. Oh, that's the last crew from the high school that um, cleaned up the cemetery in 2000, the, the help clean up the cemeteries in only 2016. So apparently they do it every year, so we're very grateful for that. So at any rate, now I'm going to try to go through some of the cemeteries, but before I do that, um, I want to give you just a brief overview of the spiritual history here in Oli. Um, I could do a whole talk on that, it's fascinating to me. But because a lot of the families buried on these private cemeteries were very involved in some of the different groups that came through Oli. When I mentioned them, um, and I mentioned certain names, I just want you to have a little bit of reference. So um, Oli, as you know, was settled uh, mostly by French Huguenots in, in, in the first years, in the 17 teens. Um, and there were no churches around at that point. Um, there was a ch Lutheran church in New Hanover, down in Wertown, and there was a uh, St. Gabriel's was getting organized, that was English speaking. And I think the Luther Church in Amityville was mostly English speaking people, so there were really no Germans. But there was a Reverend Samuel Goulden, who was the ancestor of the Goldens here in Oli. He lived in Germantown, but he used to come up and preach in people's barns. Um, just because there was nobody else to preach to these, um, these families. 
And then um, in the 1720s, you may have heard of this sect of the newborn. Um, that's a long history, I can't go into it all. But a man by the name of um, Matthias Baumann in Germany had some sort of vision, crisis, spiritual experience. And um, he believed after that that you had to have this conversion experience to go to heaven. But after that, you couldn't sin anymore. So um, he was apparently a fairly honorable man, but some of his followers took that as license and um, didn't have very, um, very pleasant lives. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I just, um, I just thought I'd read a few sentences from an autobiography of Maria Barbara Leinbach, who came here as a baby with her family in the 1720s. And she, what she said about the, the atmosphere here, she said, um, I was born in 1722 in Hochstadt, came here as a child of one and a half years. Um, my parents settled in only in 1723. They brought me up in the Reformed religion. My father was a pious and God-fearing man who made me cling, according to the best of his knowledge, to all that was good. We lived very retired and cut off from the world. My father held home devotions with us children and trained us in singing and prayer. So that's basically all they had in the 1720s. Um, if you were not part of this newborn sect, then you just had people preaching in your home. Um, you had some German Baptist dunkers that came through in the 1730s. Um, some of the Yoders got involved with that, and um, some of them went to the community in Ephrata, in the Ephrata Cloister. And then you did have a Reformed Church organized in 1736. Um, but also, there was a huge, um, I want to mention the Moravians because you probably heard me. No, I, yeah, I don't need all those lights. <laughs> um, <laughs> you want to see the slides. Um, anyway, yeah, um, Henry Antes from, um, from Frederick was a, um, a very pious man who, um, he invited, he was concerned about the, the spiritual welfare of all these firms on the frontier. And he invited George Whitfield to come and speak. Now, George Whitfield was Billy Graham of the day. Um, so he came and spoke in Abraham, no, I think he's, yeah, in Abraham the Man's Barn um, to thousands of people. And, but he's, he was English. He's, he spoke in English. Um, and had him speak through a translator. But he was so impressed by the hunger of the people here who had no pastor, no church, or whatever, that he. Um, he wrote to Count Zinzendorf, the leader of the Moravians, and said, please send somebody to speak to these people in their own language. So Zinzendorf did, and the next year, uh, the Bishop Spangenberg came to Oli, and he brought two women with him to work with children. And that really opened the hearts of the Oli families, that somebody wanted to teach their children to read and write and teach them Bible stories. So that was sort of the beginning of the Oli Moravian Church. It has a long history, but um, they, yeah, um, maybe I'll say a little more. Um, in 1742, Captain Zidorf himself came to only um, three Indians were baptized at the Sea Turk Farm. You probably heard that story. Um, and there was a congregation organized. But after five, ten years, there were administrative problems like happened in a lot of organizations. And in 1765, it sort of fell apart. Um, in the 1750s, you also had Dr. George de Benevo, who um, is considered by some the founder of universalism in America, and he organized a school and started preaching too. Um, in 1770, you had the Dunkards up in Christtown, and then in 1809, there was another sort of evangelical revival, um, the followers of James Albright, who was a follower of John Wesley, um, the English Methodists, and he started churches all over Pennsylvania, evangelical churches. Um, and the Bertlets got very involved with that, or one family of them, Daniel Bertlett, um, who uh, gave it, opened his, or uh, built a meeting house on his farm to uh, be open to all these traveling preachers. So anyway, that's just a, a, a short um, outline of some of the religious history, and some of the people that I will mention in the cemeteries were involved in one way or the other. That's the uh, Moravian graveyard, what's left of it. Um, um, in 2009, I think, it was um, Phoebe Hopkins who helped us find the site, I think. Um, but there's, there's nothing left of it in no tombstones. But anyway, now, back to the, uh, on to the 
the families and who they are. Um, when you see all these old black and white pictures, those are, were the ones I took to the book that we published. I was taking them back in the 80s of black and white because at that time we didn't have computers to make them look pretty and publish easily. So the black and white are the then pictures, and the color pictures are now. But anyway, that was the uh, original Kine Homestead. Johannes Kine um, is thought of as the first person to get a, a land grant in Oli. He um, supposedly came here in the early 1700s and sort of staked out a claim, at least that's how the story goes in the family, and then went back to Germany and got married and brought his wife back and got a, a, a work in, well, what's now Pike Township in 1709, or thereabouts. Um, so, and then some of his descendants are buried on that cemetery, and that's what it looks like today after they've restored the wall. And then one of the next, oh, there's another kind of cemetery on that same property, which that's what it looked like about 1982. Um, that's what it looks like after they took the plaster off the walls and um, cleared it out and things like that. Okay, now, Isaac de Turk, um, that, that's the original de Turk cemetery. Um, and That's what it looks like now. There's uh, a stone that was set in the wall. By the way, I wanted to mention um, when when people put you know take up stones and put them in the wall, that's actually better than laying them flat. So I'm grateful these old stones were put in a wall because sometimes when people want to take up stones, make it easier to mow, they just put them flat, and then the rain and snow over years and years will wear out the carving, and it'll be hard to read in 20 or 30 years. So it's actually better to stand them up on your way if you can't keep them where they were. But anyway, so Isaac was, um, Isaac was born in, well, he was a French Huguenot extraction. And he first came over to New York in 1709. And then um, came down to Berkshire in 1712. And his wife, Maria was also a French Huguenot. She was a widow of a Peter Weimer and had a daughter by that who then married Abraham Maria after they were here. So these families are all interconnected. Um, and that's another um, cemetery on that same farm. This was probably taken in the 70s. I think it was George Meiser's picture. And that's been very nicely cleared out in the stone wall, repaired and things like that by the Graveyard Association. So we're very grateful to um, property owners who um, allow these kind of things to happen. Um, I, um, I want to mention also John Deter, who was um, a son and grandson of Isaac, was one of the uh, people that was very involved in the Moravian Church. In fact, um, sometimes I have that paper here. But there, um, if you read through, why I mentioned the Moravia so much, if you read through the Moravian church records, you'll find John Bert, you know, Jean Bertlet, Bertlet, um, Abraham, uh, Abraham Bertlet, uh, John B. Turk, you'll find all the Oli families in these Moravian records. They were very, um, it was like a revival at that time. Um, now, that, this is, was the Le Man Cemetery back in the 80s. You can see it was very overblown. And that's been cleaned up and restored too. So we're very grateful for that. Um, um, Abraham Le Man came over from Amsterdam. He was also a Huguenot, but they, his family had lived in Amsterdam for a while. Um, and I believe that's where he was born. And let me see, this is the Herbine Cemetery, Jonathan Herbine. Um, he got his land in 1717. He was one of the two elders uh, elected as elder of the Moravian Congregation in 1742. Um, um, I found his signature on his will, so that's he signed in German. Um, that's inside the graveyard. And 
that's what it looks like now. But anyway, um, he was in one of the elders of the Moravian congregation, and after a while, there was there was like happens sometimes. There were struggles and arguments among the leadership, and there's one record where um, he. Some, some of them were upset with Zinzendorf because Zinzendorf went in to build this big fancy church building and very organized and these simple farmers here just keep it simple, let's just have a little meeting house. And it turned into a huge argument. And in the end, um, Justin Herman and a few others just walked out of the meeting, but he did write a letter which was preserved in the Marine Archives, a long letter explaining um, everything that happened and you know saying he had no ill will and all that kind of thing. But there's, there's, there's so many stories that you read about these people, it makes it more real than just seeing their tombstones. Um, the Peter Cemetery, Angle Peter came in 1720, and that's been very, whoops, that's been very nicely cleaned, and um, I think between the Graveyard Association who helped with the wall and the owners themselves helped cap it, I think, and they keep it up um, to date. So um, that's also been very well restored. Now, this is on the, you probably recognize that on the Conrad Reif homestead. Conrad Reif is one of the ones involved with that sect of the newborn that I talked about. Um, uh, there's, there, um, there's a long story, you can read some of it in, I think, Phil Pendleton's book on the Only Valley. Um, you can also find it on the inter internet. There was a big, apparently a big to-do at a funeral in 1753. I don't, I don't, you know, it was pages and pages of what happened. But um, Philip Coolwine, who I think was the son-in-law of Matthias Bowman, I have to look at my notes. Um, who was that founder, and he had, they had, they were both here and only go cool, and cool one was the first owner of this. And um, I even found a record that says that someone in 1997 found a tombstone on that property that just says cool wine 1736 or 1739. So I haven't seen that particular stone, but um, anyway, so, but the, the rest were involved in that. Conrad Ray also, the first time I right, had an organ in the 1730s, one of the few organs outside Philadelphia. So um, that, was, that was quite something. I always wondered if Johannes Leinbach, the immigrant, ever got to play it because he was an organized, organist and school teacher in Germany for 23 years. So it'd be nice if he had an organ to play over here, I don't know. But anyway, this is a very bad picture of the Red Cemetery up at the top of a hill. Um, the wall's still there, the stones are still there, it still needs a little cleaning, but it just shows you how cemeteries need to be taken care of, just like your lawn. So, you know, we're very grateful for all the, uh, the scouts or the high school kids or, or whatever that, that do this every year because um, the trees and the, and the weeds don't stop growing. So it's very nice that uh, people are interested enough to take care of them. That cemetery looks down in the middle school, if you... Look out yes. the front door of the middle school. It's all the way up in the hill, and it's one of the most beautiful cemeteries in the in Ole, as far as the view. Yeah, thank you. It's yeah, up on, like at the inter almost at the intersection where Redford comes down, once in Old Greensburg. It's like it says, um, beautiful spot. I love driving over right Road. Okay, the hopes um, came in. 1725, well they came earlier, but they came to Oli around 1725. Rudolf Hoke, he's also on the list of Moravians, Moravian congregation, and his um, descendants are buried there. And that, that farm was in the Hoke family for uh, nine or ten generations. I think it might have been sold now, I'm not sure. I, I thought I saw some Mennonites or, or Amish riding a bicycle. But anyway, um, yeah, it's still a cemetery. And then there's another Hope Cemetery, Hope Berglund Cemetery on Friedensburg Road. I haven't, I wasn't able to get to this. It's on private property up a, up a lane, and I didn't go in and ask the landowners. But this was, um, this was on Samuel Hope's property, who was a son of Rudolph, and Samuel Hope was very involved with the Meridians too. Um, 
I don't know if I should say this or not. We just went through a crazy election with all kinds of scandals reported everywhere. Well, I don't know, scandals in Oldie. On this cemetery, <laughs> on this cemetery is a Dr. Amos Bertolet, who died in 1829. And his tombstone says he's buried with his infant daughter. He apparently married Lydia Hope just a few years before, so apparently their first child died. The sort of unfortunate part of the story is that about six or seven years before, there were two sisters, Manwiller sisters, whose father was a constable in all. And they each had a child baptized at Schwarzwald, illegitimate, born six months apart, and the father of both <coughs> the children was Amos Berlick. <laughs> So, you know, we're all human, I, you know, I don't know what the story is there, he was a doctor, but um, some people would say he got stressed and started a few years later, I don't know. And then there's another Pope, De Turk Cemetery, you probably recognize along 662, that was before it was, years ago, before it was cleaned, um, and now I think you know, people go in and clean it. I mean, now and then I think they've dug up some tombstones actually and replaced them. So that's, uh, that's always nice. Oh, I did forget to tell you when I was talking about Jonathan Herbine, the original cabin, that form was later sold to a Bertlet, and that's the original cabin that is now in the Daniel Boone homestead. That was Jonathan Herbine's cabin. Whoops. Okay, now we go to the Berlitz. We all know about Berlitz. Um, Jean, French, and um, yeah, he, he brought along a French Bible, which is supposedly still in the family. I've never seen it. Um, dated 1567. But anyway, that was the cemetery as it was in the 80s, and it's still up there on the hill, taken care of. So we're grateful for that. Um, he was also very, very heavily involved in the Moravians. And in fact, I think um, he was one of the ones trying to help him to get George Whitfield to come here and speak. Um, and it's also said that he, um, he was a great friend of the Indians. There were, there were many Indians here in only in the 1720s and 30s. And they got along very well with Germans. And there are stories that um, <coughs> They would teach, you know, they would teach the kids, the German kids, to fish, and, and they would share, the, you know, the women would share cooking secrets and things like that. Um, well, apparently, there, um, Jean Bertlet used to go out and, and talk to the Indians about God, and he would pray with them and like have little Bible studies with the Indians. Okay, then, um, then we have the Bertlet Meeting House, which actually was originally another private Bertlet, Bertlet Cemetery. The middle plot is where Abraham Bertlet, a son of the immigrant, um, is buried, 1711 to 1766. His tombstone, original sandstone, is at the Historical Society of Berks County, but there's a replacement stone here. Um, so anyway, um, this is, I always find this cemetery very interesting. Um, that's that same plot today, um, and there's generations and generations of Berlitz buried here. Um, some of them have very interesting stories. Um, um, just to give you, just for a little variety, I thought I'd show you Abraham Berlitz's estate inventory, the one that died in 1766, the son of the immigrant. This is some of what he owned when they did an inventory. You know, a white mare and a brown mare and another brown mare and a gray mare. Um, you know, cattle and smith's tools. Um, anyway, the inventories I find very interesting because working in the courthouse. And if you look at, um, he had all these notes bought that people owed money to. And his whole estate was 3,497 pounds 10 shilling and 8 pence. Looking it up in dollars today on historical um, conversion charts, that would be about half a million dollars. So um, that was a lot of money. And then Daniel Bertlett, his grandson. Oh, wait. Oh, oh I forgot to tell you about 
Did we get to Esther yet? We didn't get to Esther. Okay, I'll tell you about Esther. So this is Daniel, um, who was his grandson, and he's the one who built the meeting house. He was uh, apparently very touched when um, this follower of Jacob Albright came through in 1809, and there was like a little revival in the Oldie Valley. Um, and he, um, you know, donated this land to, to, to build a meeting house, and then he invited just any, if he didn't found a church, he just invited anybody that, any preachers that wanted to preach the Word of God could come and preach in that meeting house. Um, and then it grew in, you know, it grew into a, it, for a while it was an evangelical association. And then go to the Manta meeting house and other things. But anyway, he was also a, a poet. He wrote a lot of hymns, both in German and English, that are published in the Evangelical Hymn Book. Um, he also had a sawmill. His obituary says he was a mechanical genius. He was, um, he was a very successful uh, sawmill operator. And when he died in 1868, he was said to be the richest man in Oli. Uh, his estate was worth $175,000 at the time, which today would be $2.8 million. So he was also very prosperous, but very, apparently um, very generous, too. Um, yes, um, Esther was the wife of Abraham, and she was, she was born in 1711, died in 1798, and it, Peter Bertolet, in his a doctor who you may have seen his journal, I think from 1860, he says that she spoke the Lenape Indian language. She was made friends with the Indians and learned their language. Um, and Daniel Bertolet, who I just showed you that picture, Daniel Bertolet, her grandson, remembers talking to her and when because he was like 19 when she died, or 17, and, and she was <coughs> in her young days a great friend of the Indians. She was a de uh, she was a de Turk, so um, so we have to figure out which uh, probably a sister of Isaac that had to be some genealogy for that. Um, then somebody else interesting on that <laughs> the first female doctor in Berks County was Esther Bertlett. Um and she went first to the Oli Academy and then she went to Mount Holyoke. Um, female seminary, and then she went to the Women's Medical College in Philadelphia back in the 1860s. And then she became a doctor, had an office in Reading, but she also married and found, uh, found time to have 10 children. <laughs> but I didn't know that, first female doctor in first time. Okay, then uh, there's a third Bertlett Cemetery on, off of Bertlett Mill Road. Um, at the other end toward 73. And that's been very nice to be cleaned up and apparently the present owner is really um, taking care of it very well. I think the Graveyard Association did some work on the wall. Okay, then we have the Kaufman Cemetery, of course. David, whoops, David Kaufman came here in the around 1730. I can't, you know, I, I can't show pictures of it every century. There, I, um, I should mention, there, when we did this research for the book, we came up with about 300, evidence of over 300 graveyards in Berks County at one point, either mentioned in deed or still exist. About 120 still have some remnants, but one third of those are in Oldie, almost. So Oli was very good at preserving their cemeteries. Um, this um, Colonel John Lesher, who um, you may know was um, an Iron Master and he was also in the Revolutionary War. He, um, he was a member of the Constitutional Convention in 1776, and he was also uh, commissioned with purchasing supplies for Washington's army. Um, well, 1777, probably, before I entered Valley Forge. And there's, a, there's the monument that talks about him. He's under the Holy Forge. So. In that first black and white picture, those stones are no longer there? That's just, those were posts. They're not tombstones. Oh, okay. 
Those were posts holding up a fence of poles in between them. There were never any stones that we could see. I don't know why. He was, he was a very prominent man. I don't know why he didn't have tombstones. Okay, then we have the Nab. This is one of my favorite cemeteries. Um, up on the hill, uh, overlooking, overlooking the Nab farm. Um, when we went the first time, it was just up on the hill in the field. But now today, there's a lot of houses built there. And, you know, the, the, the property owners are very, very gracious and very interested and takes care of the cemetery itself. Um, the, the, the Graveyard Association came through and tried to repair some of the stones. Um, I believe this was first a Seltzer cemetery because there's a Jacob and Anna Elizabeth Seltzer there who were born in the late 1600s. And it was their daughter who married Michael Knapp. They only had the one child. Um, his wife was Eva Seltzer. Um, and then that's how it, became, it turned into the Nam family. There's, uh, there's also a story in the history of Lehigh County, if you're reason that's moved to Lehigh County, that says that in 1816, the original cabin burned. And there were two sisters that escaped their, it was, the, somebody remembered that it was in the winter and there were 18 inches of snow on the ground. And these two girls ran out of the house in their night clothes barefoot and had walked to their uncle's house about a quarter mile away. So um, I don't know what happened to the rest of the family, <laughs> but this story talks about these two girls that walked barefoot in 18 inches of snow. Um, um, that's one of the girls, uh, Susanna. It mentioned their names, uh, Susanna, uh, who later married Isaac Herbine. Um, she was born in 1804. The fire was supposedly 18. 16, so she was 12 at the time. Then we have the Beaver and Leisure Cemetery. Um, whoops. There. It's also been cleaned out and the wall repaired. They were Beaver. Um, some of his descendants were up at um, Mertz Church near Dryville. But um, and then some of them were here in the only area. Is that the same ledger as the Colonel ledger from the previous slide? Yes, yeah, someone, one of, either one of the Beaver girls married a lesser or one of the lesser daughters married a Beaver. Okay. I, That's the lesser married Beaver. Okay, thank you. And this cemetery is located where? Um, this is off of Mud Run Road. I have a book here that gives you the locations. You can look afterwards. It's off of my um, uh, Yeah, sort of at the edge of at the edge of the field at the tree line. <laughs> Not far from where Jeffrey's suit runs into that murder. Okay, now the Schneider Cemetery. Um, Johannes Schneider came around in 1717. Um, you may, that's sort of famous for being the farm where Susanna Cox works. You might remember the story of Susanna Cox, the last um, woman that was executed in Berks County in 1809 um, for killing her infant, uh, illegitimate daughter. Um, anyway, there's a huge, there are lots of articles about how that happened and, um, you know, lots of people were, a lot of people were up in arms and they didn't think she should have been executed. And, but anyway, so she was the last one. But the, the cemetery is a, a huge cemetery. Um, that it's been, it's been cleaned and restored. I was just there last week and wasn't able to get a front on picture from the gate because the owners, who are very gracious, said, oh, by the way, when you walk out here, watch out for the box trap that we set for groundhogs because we caught a skunk. <laughs> So I made sure I circled around. <laughs> Didn't go near, but the back of the skunk, the box truck was right in front of the gate, about 10 yards out. So This is behind Chuck Hetrick's house in Limekill. Yeah. Where they, yeah. Supposedly there's more Revolutionary War veterans buried there than any other place in Berks yeah. County. 
There are a lot of them, yes. Um, yeah, you can see some of the flags. And um, it's interesting, a lot of the stones have the women's maiden names, so you can see all the families interconnected. There's Schneiders and the Vans and the Turks and Herbines. Um, um, so it's almost like a little community cemetery in Limekiln, it seemed. And then we have the Hunter Kent Cemetery, Colonel Daniel Hunter, um, who was also in the Revolutionary War. Um, he was um, he, he was a colonel and had a under his charge I think 325 men from Oli um, from August to December of 1777. They were at the Battle of Germantown and the Battle of Brandywine, and they may have been in New Jersey first. Um, then he also served in the Constitutional Convention and the Pennsylvania Assembly. Um, he was also paymaster of the county militia. And he died of an illness he contracted at the Pennsylvania Assembly of 1783. That's the inside of the cemetery. Um, there was a we're not sure who that, I, I have to go back to see who that sandstone is, but um, Chester D. Turk, who went there back in the 1920s or 30s, um, said he couldn't read it, but he copied some dates. Well, they're not the dates of Daniel Hunter. Uh, it's someone who died a few years later, so it may be his wife, or I'm not sure. Um, or it may be Anthony, his father. Um, but he's very as Daniel Yeager, which you know, in German is Hunter. Um, the, the sort of, um, today when they're taking care of cemeteries, when there are large trees that are, have root systems that are uprooting tombstones and walls, you almost have to cut down the tree. But when we went there back in the 80s, um, there, were, there were, whoops. Um, that, Tree, or yeah, or maybe it was there was anyway there was a huge stump right next to the grave of Daniel Hunter, as if the stone was growing out of that stump. Um, it had been cut down years ago, but I thought they must have planted that when he died because it was just living. But the there was a little sapling that was growing out of the trunk, uh, uh, out of the stump, and I said that's interesting, and you know how it, trees. Things uh, we knew themselves, but that was all cleared out now, to, to, so it doesn't have root any other tombstones. But it was sort of sad after 200 years we had a tree, and then it died and was cut down, and then we had another tree coming out. But um, but when you you know when you preserve things, you have to make decisions. Um, that's his signature from the paper he signed in the courthouse. And then the Widener Cemetery um, on near the intersection of um, Berlin Mill Road and Humber. Um, Tychicus Widener, that's a very biblical name. Um, apparently, the, uh, the Widener's were Mennonites. Um, and it's, it's said that he had, uh, he, he used to preach in, in barns and things like that too in the mid-1700s. Or late 1700s. And it's always been well preserved. They've redone the wall lately, but they did leave the buttercups, which I thought was nice. They're pretty in the spring. <laughs> and there's a wiser cemetery on the old Septi Turk farm, the one with the Victorian farmhouse that you see from 73 across from the field. Um, They put a fence around it today. Um, also, Daniel Manwiller, who I mentioned was the constable who had the two daughters um, that were involved with things further. But anyway, um, he's buried on here, and I haven't found any connection with Weiser's. I don't know why he's there, but he was a constable. And then we have just a few miscellaneous ones. Mountain Mary, all heard that story, I'm sure. Um, 
I did go back there. It's way, way off a dirt road. I don't know if it's still dirt or if they paved it now, um, going down from Hill Church. But anyway, there's, there's, there were three, we found three or four field stones, so. Um, and then also up near there, this was a mystery woman um, that we had the story from George Meister and Ray Peabock, who said that um, they heard that somebody had this tombstone in the woods and they wanted to know who it was. Well, they heard that to read tombstones, um, maybe you go with the flashlight. So they went walking through the woods like 11 o'clock or late at night with a flashlight trying to read the stone. Um, Later on, when we went, we put flour on, which now I hear is a no-no, but at the time we didn't know that. Um, we brushed it off. <laughs> but um, we got, it, it's sort of a mystery. It's a Maria knee angle, that part we can read, and we can read her death date, and that she had three sons and two daughters. But we can't read who she met, you know, we can't read her actual name. It's like M-A something E-R, and we can't figure out who, who she really is. But the other... Um, think about it, it does say that um, she's a Mitch Fester Diese Gemeinschaft or something, a sister of this congregation. So it's probably a stone that was taken from a church cemetery at some point because there was no congregation that she would be a sister of out there in the woods. We don't know. Okay, now I just. Um, Going on to, I want to show you a little bit about the different types of tombstones you read. You can see. Um, Johannes Schneider, he, that's the um, oldest tombstone in Berks County. Uh, I mean in Oli, excuse me, not Berks County. I have that later. <laughs> but it says he was born in 1687, died in 1743. It's very readable. Um, the early, early ones in the mid-century seem to have, they used German, but they use English Bach letters. Um, and you can see this is also, this is from the Nav Cemetery on the right. This is Judith, or Utica, um, Allstadt. And we know who she is, um, you know, wife of, I think, Martin Allstadt. Um, the interesting part about this, and I haven't figured it out, but if you look up at the top of the stone, those are just like initials. We don't know. Are they initials for descendants, or are they initials that people take to the funeral, or, you know? We don't know, but um, I've never seen that on any other tombstones, just lots of initials at the top, and then the, uh, the, the wording actually starts below. But those are the sandstones. And then um, the next generation of sandstones, they started using, I guess the stone carvers got templates they could use to use the German script. So um, these are also from the Nab Cemetery. You have Johannes Nab, and it's very readable. Um, he was born in Fettersheim. It tells you where he was born in Germany in 1723, died in 1770. And then on the right, this is Jacob Seltzer. Um, here Ruth, here first over to Lansman, <coughs> Johannes uh, uh, Namens Jacob Seltzer, and then it gives his he was born in 1680, and his wife also has a sandstone. Then in the next generation, you have I call them mottled. It's I don't know if it's I don't know if it's a marble or granite. I don't know what kind of stone it is, but it has these these stripes, sort of, and they often, they, they peel up in layers. It's, it's a, a delicate kind of stone, and, and they break easily. Um, and it's, the carving wasn't as deep, so it's harder to read. This is Jacob Kine on the left, and Peter Nab on the right. They're harder to read unless you, when we used to put flour on, but I'll tell you a little bit later, now they're saying we're not supposed to use flour. Well, yes. we call them tiger marble now, but that was marble that came it was the first marble used in the area, but it was very expensive. And obviously, you don't know why we had marble in the area. It came as ballast from Dutch ships, and it was therefore not taxed. So it was exceptionally inexpensive. It wasn't considered high enough quality marble to be used in Europe. Okay. So they are more of it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think I had read that sand, the sandstones also were also <coughs> brought over as ballast in the earlier years. 
Um, then later on, um, you have some that um, the carving gets steeper and they, they last a little longer. Um, and it starts to get a little more fancy with the curving at the top. Um, it's Esther Schneider on the left. <coughs> and Barbara Schneider, Nick Ritter, went to Jacob Schneider, right? And then um, from the Yoder Cemetery, oh, I didn't tell you about the Yoders. Um, some of them, the Yoders came from some of the, uh, Steffisburg, Switzerland. Um, the first ones were Anabaptists in Switzerland, and I was actually there one time when I was in Europe visiting a friend, and, and she took, she found out where this was, and we went and actually found the farm where they came from, where they, where the Yoders lived, and there was a spring out in the woods where the Anabaptists, like, they believed in baptizing adults and not children. So they had their first, like, the Swiss Anabaptists had their first baptism at this Yoder farm in Switzerland. Um, so I was, I was there one time, and um, the owners said, oh yeah, we get, we get these buses of these Americans with strange dress. <laughs> they come and want to see this. You know, they're Mennonites and Amish, I guess they go over there and see where the Yoders came from. Um, but one of the early Yoders was apparently not very nice. Um, I don't know if it was Hans or Yost, it's written up in Peter Bertlett's journal, but he was apparently drank a lot and was not very nice to his wife, and eventually his wife left him. Um, she was a sister of Martin Schenkel. I haven't been able to trace that genealogy because I don't have any records of the early Schenkels. But um, anyway, so there are all kinds of things happened back there. But this is, these, this is from the, um, the cemetery at Pleasantville that's now the Union Cemetery was originally a Yoder plot. And you could see, if you walk all the way back there, you could see where the Yoder plot was. The stones are sort of facing a different direction. Um, and then later it was expanded just into a, like a meeting house cemetery. There, I think there was another, was it one of the NABs that I, yeah, one of the NABs I also had a um, advertised, no. I'm not sure. Someone advertised in a journal in Philadelphia that his, his wife had run away and he wasn't going to be responsible for her death. <laughs> oh, it was Abraham Herbine. It was, um, I think it was the brother of Jonathan. Um, his wife ran away in 1739. He wasn't responsible for her death. I don't know if I'm correct or not, but I think that Yoder Cemetery is at Pleasantville across the street from the Great Silk. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, it's a long, you can't drive back anymore, but I just, the other day I walked that uh, long grass path behind, you know, through the gate and went back to the, the old stones. You'd have to go there in the morning when the sun's in a good direction to be able to uh, read them. Um, then we uh, started to get even better carving into the 1820s and 50s, 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, deeper and more elaborate script. And you can see how, I have the two next to each other, um, you can see how much easier the later one is to read in 1848 than the early one. This was the middle of the century again, a very deep carving. And this is when they, uh, they redid, you can see where they redid the Abraham Berlitz stone, because he died in 1766. There's no way that's a tombstone from 1766. That's, um, that's the carving from almost, almost identical to the one on the right in 1837. <coughs> and then, um, again, just other examples of the carving. And uh, then in the sort of in the middle of the century toward the Civil War, they started to put, like that's the tree of life. And then they started to put more, sometimes it was an angel, if it was a child, they put different kinds of um, symbols on the tombstone. That's from the Hook of the Church, so that might be our hook, the main hook. And then in the Victorian days, this is a private cemetery, but then we got the really elaborate ones in the late part of the century with the urns and the flowers, vases. Like 
uh, that's at the Old Church in Spanceville, just to show you some of the art. They must have been very expensive tombstones. Now, I wanted to, oh, what happened to the first one? Oh, the top line disappeared. I wanted to show you the alphabet, and it seems to have gotten mixed up on my computer. Um, I don't know how. But anyway, um, I do have, if anybody's really interested in learning how to read old German tombstones, I can, um, I can send you a handout that has the German alphabet on one side and then some German vocabulary on the second side that will help. Um, uh, like just some of the words that, that you find on tombstones. And a few of them can, um, can confuse you. Like um, there's, if you don't know German, there's a word, uh, which means unmarried. And on, there's a cemetery in the Heckler Esterly Cemetery in Exeter Township. Um, there are two, there's two, there's a man and a woman buried there next to each other, and they look like husband and wife. Um, but if you read the tombstone in German, it says on both of them, died unmarried. So they were brother and sister. So that can confuse genealogists. So you have to really try to read all German before you assume that people buried next to each other are husband and wife. And anybody that's interested, I can send you that handout. I apologize for that. Um, the alphabet, I, I had it all there. But there, there are some letters that look very much the same. I should go back and show you on some of the those tombstones I just showed you. Um, do we have anything here? The K is what I wanted to show you. Uh, I don't see a K. We well, can see the S on the right, the, the, the 28th of April. That letter after the A is an S. In German, it looks like an F, but um, I believe they say 20, 28. They say 28th. Um, I don't know if we can find any K, hey. but the, the lowercase K, hey, there is Nicholas. You see Johann Nicholas Nab on the right in the middle of the stone, N I C K. That's just a high letter, almost like an L with a crossbar on it, and that confuses a lot of people too. But it's sort of an art learning to read the old tombstones. Um, oh, there it came out right. I don't know why it didn't come out right this first time. <laughs> but anyway, so those are the letters. Um, you can see, look at the capital E and the capital G and the capital C. A little hard to tell them apart. And a little too hard to tell the difference between a capital N and a capital R. So there are a lot of letters that can confuse you. And the B can look like a B, believe it or not. Um, and then the lowercase x looks almost like an R if you don't see that little tail. X is not a very common letter. But, but you can see the lowercase k there, too, how it looks almost like the L, just with the little cross bar. Um, and then the S, when you see that, if it's in the middle of the word, it's the long one. The, the one that looks like an F. If it's at the end of the word, it looks like a regular S. And then a double S or an SZ is that one together at the end, like an SZ. Okay, now, reading tombstones. I told you um, back, way back, we used to put flour on tombstones because it was so easy to read. You could see it just brings out the lettering of things that you couldn't see with the naked eye. But now they say that even if you brush it off, that's not good because it can leave little particles there. Um, and they want you to use um, something that's more uh, biodegradable. Um, but the, the, the first thing that you should do if you're trying to read an old, old stone is go look in the right light because um, if, if the stones are facing east, if you go between 10 and 12 in the morning, the sun will be coming down at an angle and shining in the path and will bring it out. If you go when the sun's behind the stone, sometimes you can't read really thin. And it's amazing what the different light will do. Um, so that's the first thing you can do. Just go when the sun's coming down at an angle, depending on which direction the, the stones are facing. But um, 
Now, I saw one person had an idea, since we are not supposed to put flour on anymore. You could probably do the same thing with snow if you take your gloves in the wintertime. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> so, yeah, we're not supposed to do that anymore. Um, but there's also a way of using aluminum foil, not permanently, just taping it on a stone, apparently not letting the tape touch the stone, just taping the aluminum foil with the dull side out and then rubbing over it with some wet sponge. And apparently this is what happens. That was the stone and this is what happens when you get it on the aluminum foil. I haven't tried that, but it looks pretty impressive. That's the same stone? Yeah. <laughs> this is more blown up on the right, but there you can see Joseph Price on the left. If you look real close, I cut off the top. You know, it's it's, it's more blown up on the right. Um, and then there, there's something new they use, which is called D2. I've never tried it, but it's some sort of biodegradable spray. And this is what happens when you put it on, apparently. That, um, so that looks quite impressive, too, to clean it off. Now, I don't know that that would help with sandstones because they're just, the carving is very fine and, you know, there's not much to clean off of them. But um, it seems to work really well on the on the white stones. Okay, this is um, the oldest tombstone in Berks County. I just thought I'd end with this. Um, Andrew Robinson at St. Gabriel's in Douglasville. And that's his footstone on the right. Why? Yeah, we never that. <laughs> that's the footstone, but here here lies here lieth. Anyway, um, the body of Andrew Robson. Um, and I don't know if you can see, what, there, there's lots of trees around, so I couldn't get the bite on it when I just went to take it. But if you look all the way at the bottom, it says he died February, um, and then it says 17, 19, 20. That wasn't because they didn't know when he died. <laughs> that was because of the change in the calendar. So you have to keep that in mind for old, old dates in church records or tombstones because the calendar changed in 1752 and um, they went from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar and they lost 11 days. So George Washington was born on February 11th, 1731 by the old style, but they lost 11 days so it became February 22nd and because in the old Julian calendar the year began in March, get to the odds of March, so February was like the end of the year. So, in English speaking, English, England didn't change until 1752. Continental Europe changed in 1700. So some people were very confused as to when they were born. But, but anyway, that's why they put that, because it was an old style and a new style. They knew that the system was changing, you know, um, England was, in 1720 when he died, England was still in the old system, but continental Europe was on the new system, so they often put old stuff in style. So 1719 slash 20. Um, but then you have, you have German immigrants who were born in Germany in the new style in February of 1710, and then when they died over here, you know, English pastors would try, I think they had us back to 11 days or change the year or whatever, and, but they really didn't because they were born according to the new style. So it can get really confusing when you, um, when you get into those dates in the early 1700s. But the interesting thing about Andrew Robinson is his, um, this is on the back of his tombstone. It says, removed from noise and care, the silent place I chose. When death should end my years to take a sweet repose, here in a peaceful place my ashes may remain. My Savior shall me keep and raise me up again. This is what happened to his peaceful place. <laughs> the railroad goes right back to Sunday. 
Yeah. Yeah. What? <laughs> About 120 years after he died. So he had peace for 120 years. <laughs> anyway, okay, I couldn't show you all the cemeteries, and I hope I had enough stories that I didn't bore you too much with just walls and stones. But and, and does anybody have any questions or comments or corrections? Yes. Do you have a lot of material here? Well, well, what we have, first of all, is this, this guide to all the private cemeteries that we did, published in 1992. That's still available. I, it hasn't been reprinted. I found just a few copies when I was going through a storage locker. So I have maybe like three or four that I could still sell. I don't have them with me, but if you give me your name and address, like I said, I think I have three. <laughs> So, anybody that wants one, the first come, first serve. Yes? You mentioned earlier about the old house was used for tombstone. Uh huh. A lot of the old houses in the Old Valley in the 1730s and 40s, if you find brick used as floors in the basements or archways over doors, that is not domestic brick, I've been taught. That has been built in ballast that was brought off the boat to the port of Philadelphia, and there was no domestic brick at that time. Okay, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yes, I'm sorry, Kelly. Can I do a plug here? Uh, if anybody's interested, um, this is Les Ross, I'm Paul Schumann, and I'm Carla Hummel, and we are the President, Treasurer, and Secretary of the First Town Association for Graveyard Preservation. Whoever named this was not into acronyms, we have to replace the hookup. We're the folks who take care of about 40 to 50 on an annual basis of these graveyards. We take care of the about 21 or 22 on day of caring and only alone. Um, we are still finding more graveyards. We're still finding more tombstones. And we've got all the records from Laurel's book. We have our own version of Laurel's book created many years later. But we have all the information. Um, what we really need are active people who can go out and help us move a 300 pound tombstone and repair it. Um, for every one of those that you see that's this tall, there's four feet of that tombstone under the ground. But we maintain the graveyards, we rebuild we have stone ace, we rebuild the walls, we repair tombstones, we clean the tombstones, we buy a side flower. I, I got that. Um, flower out too. Um, in general, you can find us out pretty much any day in the week, but if anybody's interested, I have some of our material with us um, as far as brochures and some of our old newsletters, or if you have questions about specific graveyards, just scream. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, they do a great job. I, 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 I've gone through their newsletters online and everything, and it's, yeah, it's amazing how much they've done in rebuilding walls and, and repairing too, so I, I saw one in the NAP Center that was so that's great. Any other questions, comments? Yes. They weren't treated very well by the English up there, or the, the if not up there. I mean, she was Dutch up there, but um, Queen Anne's. The, the English powers that be that let them come there. There, there weren't very good living conditions, and they were they didn't. The English powers that be didn't keep the promises as to what they would get. Um, some of the a lot of them came out to the top of the kind of wiser. Um, the ones that came here to Oli, apparently Isaac the Turk was the first one, and since his wife was a. Um, uh, the hardcore, um, she's listed with a lot of the uh, Huguenots, and then um, other Huguenots started coming, so apparently there were several, well, there were several different like colonies of Huguenots in different places in Germany and, and Holland and, 
and stuff. And when, I guess when they heard the news, somebody invited them to come, and a lot of them ended up sitting here. Yes? What are the practices of building walls around the when did it start or when did it stop? When did it stop? That's a good question. Um, I, I think most of them in the early days had walls, the private ones, of some sort. I don't know. I, I've never done that. I've never really saw that. We ended it off the same time and you stopped having cows walking around all day. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Yes. In this book, yes. Well, um, that first book I showed is just a catalog. It locates every church cemetery in Berks County and with appendix within a 10 mile radius of Berks in all the different counties. But as far as tombstone inscriptions, um, the Historical Society has a lot, probably 70%, 80% of the cemeteries in Berks County that different people have copied over the years. Um, there's no way you could publish one book with every cemetery in Berks County. It would be like 5,000 pages or more. Um, there's a website called Find a Grave, um, which people have been inputting cemeteries, you know, not just their own ancestor, but some people go out and copy the cemetery and put it in. Um, you have to be a little bit careful because some people can read the old stones and some people can't. So sometimes you get good information, sometimes you don't. But more and more people are putting pictures. So then at least if you see a picture of the tombstone and match up to what they say it reads, if you can still read it, and you know, you can find errors. Um, the Genealogical Society also has a lot of tombstone inscriptions. Um, there was a woman by the name of Elaine Schwar who just passed away last year, who uh, started copying with, she had a few people that helped her, and they started copying by township. And she published some of those, like Albany Township or, uh, uh, I, I forget what all townships she did, but um, after she did Alice's. But anyway, so her, most of hers, I think, are at the Genealogical Society. Um, you know, that would be a massive project to kind of have a website with all of them. But I think today, most people just put them on Find a Grave um, because then you have easier access. The Schwab books are now, uh, some of them are now at the Genealogical Library. They haven't been accessioned yet, so they're in there. Okay. They just came to us recently. Okay, that's good. When you mentioned about the Genealogical Society, I know in the mid-80s, they created a sort of spot. They actually had volunteers walk the church cemetery uh, up to the information. And all of that, at least my understanding, is in, in the Genealogical Society by church cemetery. One day, I remember a say at Sanctuary. Okay. And I, you know, each church got a copy, and they had a copy there. We also send a copy to our headquarters and have So there are different places. You just have to go and go to different places. Yeah, I've, I've copied a lot of centuries too, myself, um, but never really published them. Now I'm thinking about, well, I should just get out my notebooks and start putting them on the internet. Um, it's on my to do list <laughs> one of these years. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's <laughs> the Berks County Genealogical Society, yeah. Um, yeah, that's in the uh, Go Club World.
Uh, we have some goodies back there if you'd like to stay for some refreshments. Also, um, if you haven't paid your membership dues, tonight's a great night to do that. Uh, if you're thinking about being a member, you can do so for as little as $10.